Good morning, I mean, good afternoon, actually. Um, my name is Marek Teichman, I'm Deputy Editor-in-Chief of Dziennik Gazeta Prawna, uh, a Polish legal and uh, business daily. Um, and we, we are going to discuss the, the challenges faced by, uh, by us, a society, uh, in uh, the right way of introducing golf tech tools and civic uh, uh, tech tools. And, and I guess that there will be a, a part of the discussion aimed to, to find the answer uh, about um, what, what's the difference. Mm. Let me introduce the, the panelists and invite them on stage. And after that, I will give the short introduction about how we are going to organize the discussion. Pablo Aragon, uh, Universitat Pompu Fabra, uh, Please take stage. Justyna Orłowska, head of the GovTech Poland program, Poland's largest initiative aimed at bringing the digital revolution to the public sector. Uh, Tele Peck, uh, democracy artist, change maker, and urbanist. Uh, and Natalia Vinyarchuk, Transparency International Ukraine. Yes, that's, that's the right reaction. Uh, and and if I can ask you, uh, dear audience, to uh, use your mobile devices and take part in this discussion by using the slido.com uh, webpage to ask questions and take part in voting, giving your opinions, as we want to make this panel discussion as, as interactive as possible. Um, if, you, if, you, if you open your uh, mobile devices and you type in slido.com, Come, then, then you will have the possibility to enter the number of the discussion. Uh, it's, it's over there, it's M861. So you will have a chance to ask the questions. Uh, we will be seeing all of them over here. Uh, so, so make them questions. Um, uh, and, and then we will have two polls to, to, to take part in. One is uh, uh, multiple choice to, to, to possible answers. And the, the other one is open text where we ask your opinion and your view. I will be, I will be bringing back the, um, I will be bringing back um, the, the number uh, for all those who are joining us right now, uh, slido.com, and the number is M861. I will be trying to bring the questions during the discussion, but obviously uh, uh, most of them will come up uh, at the end, so feel free to listen to, to what the panelists are going to say and then give your comments and give your questions. The two main questions, the two questions that we have over here is, is one, and I'm going to show it right now. Oh yes, I activated the, I activated the the the, um, the one of the polls. I hope, is it there? No. Oh. How to ensure the inclusivity of GovTech, and that's one of the key questions that we are going to ask. And the second question is: Should we use open source or not open source tools in? Um, building the, uh, the the GovTech tools. One more try. Oh, is it working? And I'm not 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 really see it. Oh. Please excuse me. Yeah. So you can type your answers. How to ensure the inclusivity of GovTech? And and if this question is not clear for you, I guess it will become clear during our discussion, because one of the one of the issues that we are going to discuss over here is the question of the inclusivity. The second one is the question about uh, whether we should use or not use the open source tools. And and I, I guess that the the answer to these questions would be quite. Um, uh, uh, quite obvious, but we might be we might be surprised. Yes, that's that's the multiple choice uh, question uh, that we are asking you, the audience, and then you have the uh, the possibility of asking questions. I just I just see some questions coming. Yes, you, you, thank you for making this panel finally interactive. <laughs> 
and what's the beautiful weather over here. Yes, the, the weather is beautiful. Okay, guys, um, sorry for the, for the uh, long introduction. Uh, now turning back to the, to the panelists, uh, tell you uh, if, if I might ask you uh, the question uh, first. Um, this is the same question for all the panelists, and I wanted to, to have your view. What is, um, what is for you important happening right now in the place where technology meets administration slash public sphere slash government slash local governments and the business? What, 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 what is happening and is the most important and shaping the, the GovTech, civic tech area right now? And what are you expecting uh, in the future? What are you waiting for and what are you afraid of? Uh -huh, there were so many questions. <laughs> so hi, I'm Taylor from Estonia. And now you might probably think, oh, Estonia, the miraculous uh, e-states and all the e-residences, everything, e-voting and all that we have. I'm not going to talk about that because you've heard that. And I don't have that tape with me, you know. Uh, but I'm going to talk maybe a bit about the other side of the co coin. Um, what I see in Estonia, starting with the kind of uh, fears or, or negative trends, is... Um, Still, we have this notion that, uh, or understanding that a new technology or new platform or whatever it is, is solving all the problems we have. And also kind of technology will innovate the public sector or the institutions. It's, it's slowly kind of um, transforming into that, okay, actually we need to take care of the institutions, all the processes first ourselves, and then technology is just serving our aims in doing that. So the, the, I had now the like negative and positive. It's not. I wouldn't call it a trend, more um, situation, so to say. Uh, and then just one thing I want to point out is that technology also. We we were hoping that technology brings more people to decision making processes, to designing their everyday things. Uh, you know that we can get the crowd wisdom and everything through technology. But, for example, take the e-voting of Estonia. Okay, it's the only, world in the, the only country in the world using that for 10 years already. And it hasn't increased the electorate, the turnout, actually, the voter, voters' turnout. It has remained, we just had parliamentary elections. It, the turnout is around um, 60%, 63%. Yeah, the number of e-voters is growing, but not the general turnout. So, the, it's, uh, is technology not working or, or what, what is happening there? Just one thought to, you know, drop here on these three tables is perhaps with voting, perhaps the hindering thing is representative democracy itself. So, we all the time are talking about representative democracy, we're stuck in that in trying to innovate democracy. So what if we jump out from representative democracy? Okay, so, 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 so perhaps we should get out of the box and, 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 and try to look at the, all these tools as something that can be not used to, 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 to increase the effectiveness of the tools that we have, but actually to create the new tools and the new solutions. Uh, no, not tools, but processes. Processes, the kind of renewing the institutional setting that is dating, you know, uh, centuries ago, and, and uh, also bringing in new kinds of forms of, yeah, we, we see the participatory budgeting in all these uh, trends, but also what about deliberations, deliberative democracy? It's not a new thing, but, you know, let's kind of enrich the scene of representative democracy with newer things. And then by, by that, perhaps we can renew democracy as such and the te technology is just, just serving that goal. And, and, and uh, you, you would be optimistic about uh, these, uh, the, the outcome that actually it can happen and we can enrich and, and develop democracy? Yes, because I'm a kind of change maker and process designer. I've been behind many processes of collaboration, co-creation and, and also a couple of citizen assemblies in Estonia also and advising the public sector, civil society. So I'm kind of in between civil and public sector. And yeah, I, I'm a fan of deliberations and deliberative democracy currently. But, you know, maybe that will change also. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for your perspective. I'm, I'm sorry for being a bit of a skeptic about, you know, like, uh, to, give you, to give you my view and to, um, uh, and to, to move the question forward and, and, and explain why I asked about um, uh, making the, the GovTech tools uh, inclusive is that, um, first of all, I'm, I'm a printed media person who used to work in a broadcast media, so, you know, like, it's environment of um, male managers uh, making decisions behind closed doors about what's going to be printed and what's going to be broadcasted and then, you know, like, a very traditional environment. So, yes, I'm, I'm, I think that I'm, I'm having the closed mind. Uh, and, but the second thing is that I, I have a chance to discuss uh, the um, new challenges and new tools being used with the, a lot of authorities, local authorities over here, especially in Poland, and they very often underline that uh, uh, what they see is that there is a, a clear danger of the fact that the groups that have better access to technology are actually increasing their power in the democracy that is using the technology while those that were excluded are being even more excluded. Those ones who were excluded from access to the technology are being even more excluded. And, and you, you made a point that the tur turnout in the, in the election is not increasing, so it is just making, you know, like, it more effective, but it's the very same tool. So, so that, that's the reason for my skepticism, and, and I'm sorry for, for, for that. N Natalia, uh, your perspective and your experience in introducing the, um, the GovTech tools through the NGOs is quite unique. So, um, first, like, please share your experience and, 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 and tell what is your, in your view, these two, three most important things happening. Yes, thank you for uh, giving the floor, Mark. Well, first of all, um, I think um, I ex would expect majority of here people present to be more pessimistic about the government tech uh, because it seems like the civic tech uh, is really reaching uh, the bigger impact. And uh, this is for sure um, the case in Ukraine. Um, so what I would like to speak today uh, about um, is probably the thing that you already heard about, um, is the showcase from Ukraine uh, on the electronic procurement system called Prozoro, which was the case of um, the deployment of the hybrid model, actually, of uh, the innovation that was created on the base on the civil society organization and later on um, transferred to the state. Um, but I would like also to uh, begin uh, from uh, setting the context because we understand that, for example, countries like Ukraine, uh, there are some things that for sure differ from Spain, Estonia and Poland. Um, uh, we needed to operate in the low trust environment and that imposed uh, obviously additional challenges, uh, meaning not only the low trust uh, to the government as such, but there was also low trust of business to the procurement system on the whole that was considered to be corrupted. There was the low trust of the citizens to the integral business that could uh, take part in this procurement. Um, and um, this is also not a secret that digitalization of the processes changes the whole nature of uh, trust in the uh, society and is likely actually to erode it because uh, what we have seen uh, with all the information being opened on procurement it also becomes uh, much more easier uh, to find um, the validation right for the corruption corruptive actions on behalf of the business or the buyers so it means that you it's easier to become pessimistic, uh, so to say. Um, so the, the thing that I would like to present um, actually has the features from both, from civic and government tech. And I want us to be just all on the same page. Uh, we see the government tech, right, usually uh, as something we uh, deploy to improve the processes, to optimize the processes uh, within the government and uh, in communication of the citizens with the government. Uh, instead, um, the civic 
tech tag and is tailored um, actually to make um, an impact to engage the citizens, uh, to give them more power to influence on the decision-making process, be it budgeting or be it um, reconstruction or uh, of the street, for example. And, and that was specifically our goal, because on one hand, we wanted to overco overcome all the bureaucracy that was there um, still after the revolution of dignity, but we also took a great advantage of the new generation uh, coming to the ministries, uh, change agents. Um, so those were people coming, for example, Ministry of Economic Development for the Department of Procurement. Um, but at the same time, uh, there was also a wide and vibrant active community, uh, mostly people from business, but also not with, without the technical uh, background. Um, forming the grassroots initiative uh, that was supported by Transparency International Ukraine. And here comes our first um, lessons to take away, um, is that actually that was for us um, the case of spillover of trust, if you can name so, uh, because deploying technology on the basis of the NGO that had more trust from the society than the government uh, enabled actually also to cultivate this trust towards the technology uh, later on, uh, functioning on the basis um, of the state. And um, so in this sense, the numbers also witness it. The 75% of businesses that now is taking part, are taking part in the procurement, they um, indeed confirm uh, that the corruption cases that they witness have significantly dropped and they have not experienced any corruption. Uh, but it seems like a perfect story, um, but um, as is usual, the devil is in the details. Um, the all information on the procurement in the country overnight um, became uh, open. And so in the, in the August of uh, 2016, uh, this, the use of the system became obligatory uh, for um, every entity below a certain threshold. And you could track every information in the system, so you could um, see all the procurements. Uh, but in fact, um, the, the situation when everybody could see everything not necessarily resulted in the decrease of corruption, for example. So here I see the similarity like with the voting outcome. Um, and that was the conscious choice of us on behalf uh, of the NGO um, also to deploy um, the innovative technology that would enable us to monitor the way the procurements are uh, done in the country. Uh, because the digitalization of the process and um, making it all visible it doesn't necessarily mean that people would be able to extract the benefits. Uh, they were not... Um, used to navigate the system, and there was uh, not that much capacity. Uh, so from what we started, um, we thought that seeing everything is correct, but we also need to channel this benefit and to make it possible to everybody to check everything online. And um, so since um, the electronic procurement system was deployed uh, open source, uh, it meant that through the API we could uh, use all the data and uh, form uh, the tools uh, that would enable um, every citizen to see the metadata on the level of um, the specific buyer, on the level of specific business or specific region. And our role uh, was also to create a platform that would close the feedback loop. I know that we're hearing, hearing that quite often here. Uh, but uh, just to, to tell you, uh, to, to briefly to guide you through the story that uh, we live now in, in two years. And so after the Prozora system was deployed, uh, the Transparency International started working on the Dozora project, uh, which was the whole also complex, basically, of tools. That was the platform where everybody could leave uh, the feedback on the procurement. And there was also an offline community of people that were specifically trained uh, to monitor those procurements. And uh, two years later, uh, now we are at the point when the process of monitoring is absolutely automized. Um, when the system uh, could tell anyone uh, the, the history of the procurement of specific entity, meaning that they could benchmark the business, that they could um, judge of the integrity or specific business. And I think this is also what won us uh, the trust um, as the platform, is that we enabled actually to 
check the trustworthiness of other actors uh, in the field. Uh, Natalia, uh, th there is a question directly to you from the audience that I would like to read and, and, and widen up uh, a bit, uh, just to remind all the, all, all, the, all the ones who join us, there is a possibility to ask questions and give comments to this panel discussion. Slido.com, please use your mobile devices and join us uh, by typing M, like Farek, uh, 861 and ask questions and, and give us your comments and join the polls. So the question is, uh, is it re real to change the system of voting in Ukraine and use tech tools for doing this process more easily and clearly? And, and I would understand that question, I mean, uh, as, as a question about the limits of, of the GovTech tools, because this is, you know, like, touching the, the very, you know, like, idea of democracy. And, and I don't want to move into the Elon Musk kind of, uh, you know, like, thinking. Well, but, but, <laughs> but my question is, what are the limits of the GovTech tools? And, and, you know, like, the Ukraine experience is showing that it actually, if you use the NGOs to, to join the process, they, you can move the borders very, very far away. Uh, uh, yeah, I think, thank you for the question. I'm, I want to see that person and talk to you later. I think we'll have an interesting discussion. Um, I was thinking about that myself um, multiple times, to be honest, because uh, being now in the, in the NGO center, uh, sector, I also understand that uh, civic tech cannot be the substitution for any governmental problem. Uh, yes, correct. The civic tech um, should solve a particular problem, right, to help a particular group um, of people. But you can't substitute, um, for example, the capacity within the government to deploy the civic tools. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's hard to judge on the governmental level, but uh, for example, what we witnessed, uh, we also ran uh, the ranking of transparency cities, and we judge on their uh, transparency based on the whole range of indicators, and one of them are also deployment of some tools, like being having an open, not starting from the, having an open website with all the information there, but also something that is not required by the law. Um, let's say, for example, usage of our monitoring platform that enables them to see all the risks in the procurements that they announced that could be later on used against them. Um, so in that sense, we also see the great divergency of their readiness. And we can say that if there's no political will uh, to deploy this technology, and if there's not enough invested in actually breaking this bureaucracy circles and uh, having um, the proper training programs to those who have a mandate to make decisions on deploying technology. And if there's no irregular um, culture of getting the feedback from your clients, uh, because in that sense, the citizens are the clients of the system, and you need to ensure the usability of the tool, right? Because probably you want to get as much as possible uh, from, from the tool. And uh, I know that there are, for example, in different cities, um, the examples of the portals where uh, people just register um, the ideas for the projects. Uh, I think this is an example of Reykjavik in Iceland. Uh, when they vote, so they prioritize the issues for the community, and then on the monthly basis, uh, they actually uh, they take top 10 problems to the local government to vote uh, on these issues. So I think this is also a great example of representing the interests of the community. And here, the point that I wanted to make is that, yes, GovTech is not the perfect remedy. I mean, one size doesn't fit all. Here, here we have the difference between the countries and between the interventions. So I would start from, if it's not could be addressed by the civic tech, then maybe it should be addressed on uh, the local level, but of course, depending on the scope of the uh, problem, uh, the government tech indeed uh, could scale uh, the trade-offs of the uh, digital era as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Justyna um, Rowowska, if I may, uh, you are one of the best and most positive examples of something that something positive that happened in, in uh, Polish public life in, in the last few years. And by that, I mean uh, the fact that the number of people who have business experience and uh, who had a chance to, to be a part of the professional business organizations 
and and be a part of the professional uh, business culture that is very often very effective are right now joining the public sphere so you see the transfer you see uh, one can see that in Poland there is a number of people who are successful in their business life and then they felt that they want to do something that matters and they moved to the to the political life uh, and when, when I received your, uh, your team's view on what we should discuss over here, I, I immediately saw this business perspective and including the, 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 um, the, the companies as the center of the change. What, is, is this the key to your view? Is, the, is the, the business orientation, the understanding of the business needs is uh, in your perspective, the most important thing happening in the area where administration, GovTech tools meets the public life. Okay, so thank you, Marek, for saying so many good words about me. Uh, so uh, it's like... Trying to be objective. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like... Uh, uh, when I enter, joined the uh, public sector two and a half already years ago, uh, then I started hearing something like, oh, Justina, it's public sector. Uh, it's impossible to do that. So I was, uh, it's, it took me several months to, uh, to hear that, hear, 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 and hear that. Uh, why I enter, or maybe it's, I start why I joined the public sector, because I was asked by uh, the minister back then uh, of economic developments uh, to, uh, to, to introduce some bridges between uh, business and public sector. And it was my challenge. <laughs> so when I was hearing that uh, impossible, I started asking one question. Is it a rule or law? Why I am talking about that? Because when we want to combine those two words, business and public sector, you need to open the book, which is called procurement law. Okay, so that is why I was started as asking for, is it a rule or law? And I spent half a year uh, at the public procurement office uh, asking such a question. And it turned out that most of the things was just a rule, not a law. That is why we have um, uh, managed to introduce uh, the, diff the alternative to the just normal public procurement to the tender, uh, which is a competition where there are no prerequisites for the entities that want to uh, win the public tender, uh, no formalities, and uh, only skills and ideas matter. I, f I know that it sounds like something uh, I'm talking uh, not truth, but it's totally true because I started with my team, with my perfect team, great team, I started, yes, I, I love my team, of course, and uh, started asking such questions. And um, maybe to sum up, I'm, I'm not uh, to talking about this, it's business perspective, it's like all about the mindset, mindset of being brave to ask such questions if you hear it's impossible, because it turned out it is possible. And, and um, how do you think, um, because this is clearly uh, the same direction that uh, you yeah, mentioned that we need to change the, the, the way we think, the, the paradigm we, with which we approach the, uh, uh, the reality, but how to, to make it effective for like, a great organization as a state, how to, and how to make sure that it's going to be inclusive, um, that it's going to maybe not be democratic, because it is it's going to be a democratic, but how to make it inclusive uh, tool for the society, the GovTech tools? Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing, and I think it is the most important to that, make sure that uh, the public sector can be, can open up. If you, what we did, because uh, we did, what we did, it was, why uh, uh, we uh, have shown that it is possible? Because it turned out that in our Procurement Act law, there is a procedure, uh, there is a law that hasn't been used for several, 
for 30 years. Uh, why? Because there were no procedures. Because uh, once I entered, joined the public sector, I understood that the most crucial thing is to know the, uh, the procedures. Of course, they can be changed, but the public sector is very um, risk averse. Why? Because it can, it, every year, three, three letter agencies are entering such public, uh, public entities, public institutions, because it's just a normal thing, like uh, to control if uh, the money, public money, our, all of us money, are spent properly. That is why they are used, they are using procedures. What we did, we have written the procedures with the public procurement office and now they have they are sure that it is uh, that it is uh, correct to use them and they can open they now can be open so for us i think it, the most important is to to be inclusive to include all the society the first thing is has to be the change of the mindset but to, make, to give them the tool to be open and to open about, uh, openly talk about their challenges. Their, I mean, the public sector's challenges. Um, something, so openness. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Pablo, uh, the, 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 the same question to you. The, what is the most important thing happening? And if you, if you let me bring some of the questions that were uh, sent, to us, uh, sent to us by the audience, because they are actually referring to the... To, the, to these questions and to the things that you are going to, to mention probably. Uh, maybe not the question, what is the meaning of life? We are, we are not able to answer that question, but thank you very much for bringing it on. Uh, th there is a question, um, uh, can we actually name the tech tools that, that uh, we use to promote civic participation? Can we, uh, or maybe, there should be a need for more offline governmental interaction. That's, that's actually a very interesting question uh, because we are so fixated on the tech tools maybe that, that we are forgetting about the offline, you know, like a, actually a real discussion. Uh, so, so Pablo, what, what is in your view the most important thing happening right now? And, and can you share your experience from Barcelona as well with us? Okay. So first of all, uh, thanks for the organization for doing this panel and for uh, Marek for the moderator for doing it in a participatory manner. It's always nice to talk about participation with people participating in, in the debate. So thanks for it. And I have to say that I'm really enjoying the, the conversation we're having with the other panelists. I totally agree with the critical perspective of technology that they have been sharing. Uh, in particular, when technology uh, meets governments, citizen participation, and so on, uh, well, when technology meets politics, because in the end, I, I think it's important always to remark that, uh, of course, technology is transformative. Like We can think about how digital tools were transformative in 2011 uh, during uh, the uprising in many countries, 2012 occupies Wall Street, Arab Spring, 15th Movement, and so on, but also some years later how this very similar technologies they were being used in another political context with the emergence of fake news, uh, misinformation, bots. Uh, but for instance, in the previous panel, in the previous uh, session, we saw another way of how to use these bots for the, for the common good, or for the social good. Uh, so I think this is important. I think we are talking about uh, GOP tech, uh, we're talking about civic tech, uh, we're talking about technology for politics. And I think the design of technology is political. Or from our experience in Barcelona, is technopolitical. It's the strategic and critical uh, use, design, and deployment of technology for the political and collective action. Like we should reflect on how uh, these technologies are designed. And I can talk from the, the experience uh, in Barcelona with the CDM, which is a platform that started in 2016 with a, an instance uh, for the city of Barcelona. It started by the city council of Barcelona with the platform the city in Barcelona, but now it's used in many other cities like in France, in Helsinki, but also in organizations. And I'm saying that just for giving a framework, but uh, I'm not here for talking, for promoting the tool, but for sharing the lessons we learned over these three years uh, with this uh, project of the CDM. And for instance, you were talking about 
how to do the connection with the offline. I think if we are still uh, considering like online and offline uh, participation channels as separate things, I think we are doing a, a big mistake. Uh, one thing that we started from the early beginning with this platform is like having offline meetings during the first process for the strategic city plan. So there were like calls uh, to people to participate in these offline meetings where proposals that emerged in the platform, they were discussed and also the ones that emerged in the meetings, they were after introducing the platform. So it was a full uh, loop of offline and online. So it was understanding like participation is an hybrid. Like you shouldn't, uh, of course there are differences, but they should be combined. And actually, like I think these kind of technologies are really useful when they work as a facilitation system, when they complement the offline participation of the already existing communities, rather than just uh, substituting the, the offline participation by these online channels that obviously are going to be uh, used many times by these privileged users with uh, access to the internet, but mostly with advanced skills of how to take advantage of the technology. Uh, we were talking about Trust. I think the, I think trust is, is the is the real concept here to the, in, in this edition of PDF. So, for instance, one thought that we found from the very first process in the city, which was the strategic city plan, is like many of these platforms, uh, we as citizens are being asked to participate in brainstorming, doing proposals, participating in debates, uh, sometimes even voting and participating in the decision making. But once the decisions are taken. Uh, that stops. So I think one way of building trust, and that's what uh, we did in, in, in the CDM, is like also incorporating a model of traceability. So all the proposals who were accepted, they were converted into projects, and they were uh, updated in real time to see how is the project being executed. So, so, so the way of keeping the society engaged in the in process is like how 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 exactly was it done how exactly it is done to 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 keep the engagement of 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 those who were engaged in the decision making process like allowing those people who or every citizen who was involved and even the people who were not involved in the early phases uh, to participate in auditing the implementation of what was was being collectively decided so not only building uh, technologies for citizen participation for getting ideas or making decisions, but also for auditing what the institutions or any kind of organization is doing uh, uh, with the base of those decisions. But, but then there is a question about how to allow, you know, like with, with reality of governing being um, uh, more and more complicated, yeah. there is a question about how to um, allow the, the people who are not having the experience in administration in in actually really participating in that process how to how to make sure that people who don't have the access to the knowledge and tools yeah. will actually have the access to the you know like auditing process okay that's i think it's how, how they can understand those numbers for sure this is a this is a great question like for instance in our experience we focus in uh, different directions one of them of course is documentation like having documented every aspect about how the platform or any process in the platform works so uh, everything can be read and inspect but at the same time like habilitating and we did like training spaces so public officers uh, any citizen uh, ngos and so on can get training on how to use the technology and how to get uh, uh, profit in terms of social profit uh, from the participation inside of it. And more interestingly, I think one of the most exciting experiences was like, well, we found like usually like these kind of platforms, the many decisions are being taken by developers or public officers in charge of those developers uh, because they are T-TAC technologies. So those decisions seem technical. But we are talking about technology for political participation. So every technical decision has a social and political consequence. So if there is a group of people that usually are white, male, uh, with, high, uh, with high studies, are taking all these decisions, are taking the decisions on the, the data models, the ontologies, the algorithms, like every aspect of the design of, of the platform, they are deciding what is participation, uh, how participation is, 
and more importantly, what is not considered as an official way of participation. So for doing that and connecting with the idea of inclusivity, we started a, a community which is called Mita Decidim, which is the idea of like, we want to decide how to decide. So we have our own instance as a community where we use the same technology to decide like new features, detection of bugs, a support forum, and also meet regularly, uh, presentially in Barcelona and in other places uh, to decide like the next steps of the project. But of course, many challenges we are addressing, they are, those are challenges that have been addressed by other people in the past. So we also have research seminars about gamification, electric potting, uh, data visualization. Uh, the last one, it was in March about feminists, like how to design the city uh, with a gender perspective. So getting all this knowledge from experts incorporated and getting public officers, developers, NGO, and in the end, businesses and any citizen involved to try to increase the in inclusivity and at the same time the legitimacy of the decisions that are being taken for the tool that is going to decide how political participation in the city organization is going to be done. Okay. Well, the, 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 the challenge that I see, uh, by, by my profession, I, I'm trained financial journalist and we had that feeling, like I spent most of my uh, years as a reporter reading the quarterly and yearly financial results of the companies uh, publicly listed. And we had this feeling that the more complicated words are being used and the, the more numbers are being thrown in the report, it's the, the, the more uh, probable is that the, the, the CEO and the company is trying to hide something. I mean, you know, like they, the, there is of course a level of, 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 of things that needs to be, you know, put in numbers. But if you throw, you know, like the, the words that doesn't mean anything, but they are just the fancy financial words. And when you are throwing numbers, 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 then at some point they, they don't mean anything. They are just hiding the, 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 the re reality. And, and, and I got the feeling that sometimes in governing, you know, like, you, 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 you would use all the fancy words just to hide the, the simple decisions that you need to make. Actually, in connection to that, and I think this is another topic you, you brought uh, in your first intervention, I think, like, I will quote uh, Linus Torvalds, the founder of uh, the Linux system, like, talk is cheap, show me the code. Like, any CEO can show, like, big numbers, nice buzzwords, and so on. But in the end, like, we are talking about uh, technology for governments and uh, for citizen participation and technology for democracy. So the technology is not open source, it's not transparent. If the technology is not transparent, it's not democratic. Like, it can be interesting, it can be insightful, it can be even transformative, but something that is not transparent, and when I'm talking about technology, I'm talking about open source, cannot be considered as democratic. And also, is, this is technology for political participation. So one thing that we found when developing this, this technology, this platform called the CDM, is that open source and free licenses are a needed condition, but they are not sufficient. Like, of course, the technology has to be open, but also we have to guarantee the practices of the technology. So that's the reason why there is not only a free license uh, for the code, but also a social contract where any cities or organization that they start to use the technology can uh, support the social contract with, at some point, very basic levels like transparency, um, uh, openness, collaboration, like guaranteeing like the practices that are being used by the technology are also democratic. Like, is it democratic to use open source if they are not meeting the human rights, for instance? So I think this is important to bring it to the table. Like, things of course have to be open, but they should be like politically democratic. And open source licenses are always needed. I, from my point of view, it should be compulsory, but they are not sufficient. Okay, tell you that the, I'm turning to you, but there is a question to you, and there, uh, please let me show the results of voting. First, the Referring to, to what you said, Pablo. Okay. Uh, uh, open source or not, 83% of you, the audience, answered obviously uh, only open. And uh, yes, 
And then uh, there were a number of uh, very interesting uh, answers uh, about um, uh, about how to ensure uh, inclusivity of uh, of the GovTech, user friendly. Consider all groups for representation participation, such as accessibility, ease, uh, ease of use, user-oriented co-creative collaborative design, through education that would rise trust towards technology, inclusivity of internet needs to be ensured. This means not only ensuring sustainable access to the internet, but also making sure that everybody has the right digital and media literacy skills to use it in a real and a meaningful way. That's that's very interesting point. Uh, make it huge, uh, which is uh, which is an important point as well. Simplicity, trust, good information campaign, and digital readiness of the population by service design, just do it, and yes, we can. There are some of the answers to the question about how to ensure inclusivity of the GovTech. Thank you very much for taking the active part in our discussion and tell you uh, uh, your comment to, to what was said, and as, as well the question to you. Uh, they say, I mean, tell, uh, you said that number of people voting after a voting hasn't changed. But are those same people, age-wise, occupation-wise, etc., um, uh, are the same? So, so there is a question about whether there was a, a change in the structure of the people voting. Uh, go to valimiset.ee and <laughs> check it out. <laughs> More people are e-voting, yes, but. Uh, you know, the profile is also getting more diverse, I would say, like generalize that. But I'm not super expert on that. I wanted to bring in one maybe crucial um, aspect also, what you were actually touching upon is the, what is the role of public sector in general nowadays in these hectic, transforming, uh, hateful, but also loving, uh, loving for meaningful times, uh, like, have we considered that actually? And we have so many tools and frameworks out there like guiding that already. For example, the Global Open Government Partnership is saying that the role of the public sector is yeah, to be responsible for things that are needed to be organized in the society, you know, taking care of the weaker, but also creating uh, equal opportunities for everyone, guaranteeing yeah, the freedom of speech and all the other democratic aspects, of course. But also the public sector needs to be accountable what, of what they're doing, like that they do actually the right things that are expected so that they pr basically protect the public interest and that the public interest is also then kind of co-defined. So I see, at least in Estonia, in a very tiny country of 1.3 million only, uh, this, the, the understanding of the role of the public sector is very much there is no understanding within the public sector and also outside the public sector. Also concerning, I'm not saying that the public sector has to take care of everything we do. No, no, this is not what I'm saying. I'm saying for the rest of the things that there are no finances for, the public sector needs to also create enabling environments. Uh, bring in either platforms or structures or stages for, you know, solving conflicts, kind of uh, weighing different arguments, uh, kind of mapping different interests, business interests, civil society interests, and, you know, these interests are never kind of business has only one interest. There are several interests within civil society as well. So this is the role of public sector, and I see uh, I have the feeling that the mayor of Kudansk, Pavel Adamovich, was that kind of role model for enabling civil servants. And you as well, despite the political leadership in Poland, no comments on that. Uh, uh, not good news, bad news, actually, that uh, Estonia is also witnessing the same development. The far-right party just is entering our government coalition now. So this, the role of public sector in that sense and in creating enabling environment and uh, enabling the good things to happen all the civil society all the open data like all these things i don't know if i made myself clear and and <laughs> and um as we are um <clears throat> not having a lot of time left there is a beautiful uh question that was asked by the organizers of the this year's pdf 
about gluing back broken circles of trust. So one simple question to each of you. Can, can we trust to, that, that uh, GovTech will glue back broken circles of trust, build solid collaboration and change authentic individual and collective experience into meaningful solution, beautifully written, not by me, but by the, by, by the PDF guys. You know, in technology we trust, should, should we trust, will it be brought back? Um, yes, I would call everybody to trust technology, but uh, in a meaningful and wise way <laughs> and trying to be critical. So uh, from my standpoint, I would uh, also remain critical and say actually to have this trust and trust is a, obviously a process. Um, the government needs to have readiness not only to deploy technology, to uh, be ready to act upon when technology is giving a solution to a problem, but it's rather also be a subject of the civic technology. And by that I mean uh, it's a general trend, the global trend of openness of information. And um, it makes actually possible to also keep the governments accountable, and this is something that we are also working with. So how to convert transparency actually into accountability? Um, there was recently a notion um, introduced maybe a year or two ago by MIT, which is monitorial citizenship. Um, so it means um, the engagement of the citizens uh, to the cause that they uh, care about and being able to act upon it. Um, so, and the role of the civil society here, uh, for me, is again, uh, to translate all this information that is available there in the accessible manner to the people to make meaningful choices on their trust to the government on either level. And for example, how we are trying to address it, we are targeting uh, business in one, de in one way to work with the information. And for example, parents, um, of children in school in a different way and we are creating maps for them to check procurements uh, in the school. Uh, so I think there's no silver uh, bullet, so to say, um, in terms of if we can trust uh, government tech. Um, I think we should uh, rather um, more continue this discussion into the narrative speaking on the integrity and integrity of those who make decisions and make sure that uh, those people are also chosen in the accountable way and don't let um, technology um, that has certain bias within its design to be deployed um, in the future. Thank you, Talia. Can we, can, we can we hope that technology will glue back what's broken? I come back to what I said in the beginning, processes are extremely important. So if we turn the process of general policy making from the dinosaurs era, decide, announce, defend, into discuss, deliberate, decide. If we change that kind of mechanism and then back it up with technology, then I think there's hope. And I didn't promote my platform, but uh, it's <laughs> up in the, on the wall of projects also. It's the civic initiatives platform that you can target the parliament of Estonia with. Basically, there's a law behind, so it's just an infrastructure to enable that citizen right, and you can track what happens and all that. So with that kind of civic tech funded by public money, uh, twisted, uh, we are trying to uh, nudge that scene, first discuss and deliberate, and then, then decide. Thank you, Justina. Uh, for sure, technology can be the common language for both our business, for any, for society and uh, public servants. But of course, public servants are also belong to the society uh, because it, and so the the thing that I think is misunderstood in the society that people think that public servants are different uh, people. They are maybe orangutans or something like that. No, they are the same people like uh, all of us here. Uh, now I am also public servant, but uh, and now I am public servant. And me, uh, in two years, I will be back to the public, to the business. I will be the mother or something, something. So it's all about the technology 
can be the same language of all those people. And what uh, is for me the most important, it's all about stereotypes. Both public servants and business has stereotypes about each other. For example, when I'm talking to public servants, they are very scared of startups at the beginning because, oh gosh, so there are several people who are just so make fun. No, it isn't, uh, uh, so it's not truth. And from the other side, I will tell you said the thing. When we were announcing our public tenders in GovTech, uh, in our, our competitions, uh, on the, one of the, uh, on Facebook, on fan pages, uh, I read such a comment. I, I used to read it, now, now I'm reading also. Uh, and it was like something like, when I'm here in the ministry, I vomit. Okay, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I don't want you to vomit. Uh, but it's all about that uh, we need to, because of such initiatives uh, like GovTech, Civic Tech, we can uh, go hand in hand and we can solve the challenges, societal challenges together. In, it doesn't matter if we work for the public sector, for business, because it's of, because of technology and common challenges all our society faces. And uh, also it's uh, very important to think that public servants are not politicians, they are making policies and procedures. So we have to share that public servants are doing, the, are the people who are serving, like servants, yeah, are serving our society. And so let's divide those two things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo. Okay, so I will keep it very fast. I, and I will repeat some idea that I, I say before, but how to make it trustable, like if it's open and it's free, and I mean free not in terms of free vodka, but in terms of freedom of speech, it means that it's transparent, it means that it's auditable, it means that it's traceable, it means that it's accountable. It means that we can examine the moral, ethical, and political values, not only about the, the technology, but also the way technology is being applied, the way the design of the technology and the, the design of the processes enabled by the, the, those technologies uh, are really uh, producing democratic processes. In that case, I think it's the only way to really build that trust in terms of GovTech, civic tech, of any technology that is aimed at empowering citizens for democratic purposes. Thank you very much. And at the end of the of the discussion, please let me bring back some of the of the opinions that were sent by you, uh, the, the part of the panel as well. Um, tell us, please, what is your opinion about positive voting for ACTA two? Is in bad practices for the world community? That's the Z question. Well, you know, like I'm 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 from the media company that is highly supportive for so-called ACTA uh, two. Um, uh, then there is a question about um, how easy it is to install the CDM tool and is it necessary to have information skills? Pablo, I guess that, that, that this is the question to you and it will be discussed after the panel. As we, uh, so please, the, the, the person who asked that question, please feel free to, to approach us and, and talk with Pablo. Uh, and and the one last comment that I want to show, GovTech is expensive and time consuming. Any ideas how to simplify? Well, I, I, I will leave it over here. Uh, and, and, and that's the question not only to the panelists, by, but to the audience as well and to all of us. As Justina said, we are all the same people, whether we are in the public, in the scene or in the audience, we need to find the answer for that question, all of us. Uh, online and offline. And right now we are going to be offline as we are finished. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for the panelists.